This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is French filmmaker Robert Brisson. I have two experts on his life and career, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Robert Brisson is the subject of this show. I have two experts about his life and career, Colin Burnett and Keith Rita. Let me uh, start with Colin and ask a little bit of background about yourself. Uh, what got you interested in the films of Brisson and anything you may have written about him? Um, well, I got interested in Robert Bresson as part of a philosophical aesthetics class in the late 1990s, when very few of his movies were available to see. In fact, uh, I grew up in Montreal. There was a great video store called La Bois Noire, which is now closed, unfortunately, which had two VHS copies of his films. Uh, at that point, I just started reading. I read uh, Susan Sontag's essay on Robert Bresson. I read uh, Paul Schrader's book, Transcendental Style of Film, and at that point, it was just fortuitous, there was the uh, big North American retrospective of his work that came out, put out by the then Cinematheque Ontario, organized by James Quant, uh, where I was able to see, came to Montreal, uh, all of the movies in two short weeks, and with that I thought, well, I'm very much interested in this filmmaker, and went on to do a master's and PhD where I pursued that work. You know, it's interesting you mention that because uh, just looking at all of the titles, I've seen uh, basically half of his films from Country Priest to Machete. Uh, most of his stuff, I know, even on DVD, is uh, usually not available in the U.S., and if it is, it's sometimes very expensive. And I always find it frustrating that every piece of crap that comes from Hollywood uh, gets an immediate DVD release with all kinds of stuff, and yet you'll have people like Brisson and numbers of other filmmakers from around the world that you just can't get, or if it is on DVD, it's in a different region and can't be played. So, uh, yes, me, that, yeah, go ahead. That can be frustrating. Uh, the other issue with Wesson, of course, is with some of his movies are just rights to his movies. Yeah. He had to sign away some rights in order to produce them, and there's been some difficulty with a couple of his movies over time and getting home video releases. Well, let me turn to Keith Reed uh, and ask the same as I did of Colin, I have a little bit of background about yourself and anything that you have done in related uh, works to Brisson. Well, I'm, I'm now retired. Um, I'm the university professor of French for many years. Um, and in one of the, the first university I had tenure in Kingston University in London, um, I co-taught a course on French cinema with a colleague. This was about 40 years ago and counting, so it was a fairly new area then. We showed the students film on 16mm prints. There were no downloads, no DVDs, not even VHS. It was pioneer territory. I learned while teaching. Um, and I was initially, I'd seen a few Brisson films, I was initially quite resistant to his work, um, to, to do with my own Catholic upbringing, I think, among other things. And then personal circumstances changed, and I remember finding myself watching Pickpocket and then The Diary of a Country Priest, of being so blown away with these films that I had an almost, I speak as an ex and cultural but not believing or practicing Catholic, I had a kind of Damasy moment in which I thought, I'm going to write about these films or else. And I applied for a research grant to go to Paris and work on them. And within a year, I'd written an article which had been published. And that began the development of an interest. I mention that because of the, the suddenness with which these films kind of took me by surprise. And I subsequently produced a little monograph on Masson's work, published in the UK by Manchester University Press. I haven't done any work on Bresson for a long time. And indeed, I blush to admit to of Collins for one. Uh, Bresser until discovering about it through being invited to take part in this podcast, though um, I've now punted in to review it for a UK journal, just to keep it in the family, um, but I have now succeeded in acquiring copies of, I think, every Bresser film 
in one shape or form. Some of them are on VHSs, for example. I think Quatre Nuit d'un Rêveur, Four Nights of a Dreamer, is, has not been um, DVD'd. Others have, I think the, 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 the question of zones is less pressing now, perhaps, than it was. Can't you now get multi zone? My TV now has a um, built in DVD player, and I think it's multi zone. But I have, I have the collective works, bar bar the first short film, Affaire Publique, which I had to see at a cinematheque in Paris. But with that exception, I have the collective works. I haven't revisited them for a while, but they made enough of an impact that they revisit me, if you like. Um, and um, that is my slightly longer ago history as a Brissonian. Wow. Well, uh, when one thinks of Brisson, uh one thinks of uh, spirituality, religion, etc., as you guys have mentioned. Um, let's just talk a little bit about the man and his background before we get to uh, his influences. Famously, he was uh, uh, part of a, a monograph by... Uh, Paul Schrader, on, uh, along with uh, Yasujiro Ozu and Carl Theodore Dreyer. But uh, if either one of you want to start in about his background, uh, where he came from, what his upbringing was like. Uh... Shall I go first? Go ahead, Keith. If you like. My understanding, I think that there are dubious parts in Bresson's. You're, you're on your own to this one, are you, Colleen? Because there are many. Uh, I've heard. Uh, rumours that he had a slightly, shall we say, wrong side of the tracks um, start, uh, perhaps even, um, better be careful what I say, but certainly activities of dubious legality, uh, sometimes he was an art student, ostensibly, though I've never seen or read anything about paintings he did. Um, and how he came into filmmaking, I think, is slightly mysterious um, to me. Um, but um, it wasn't, um, it doesn't seem to have been in any kind of conventional manner. I wonder to what extent there might even have been a degree of cultivated ambiguity or vagueness about his antecedents, but Colin may well know more about that. Might. Um, well, the question, not to be um, playful in my language, but how do we know what we know? Uh, this is this is an issue that comes up with Robert Bresson. What is really quite amazing is a filmmaker who has such stature in French culture, not just in French cinema, but French culture, about whom we know very little that we can confirm about his background. Yeah. What do I mean by confirm? I think that's important. For me, when I uh, completed my own book, I tried to set a standard for myself, whereby I said, if something is not in print, at the very least, I'm not going to entertain it. If no one's willing to go on the record and say it about his background, then I'm just going to take it as a little bit of rumor. It could well be accurate, but if no one wants to, as I say, uh, put the, their speech to the page, then I wouldn't accept it. I'll give you uh, just my sense of things, for instance. Um, it is rumored, it's part of the biographical legend, to use the Russian formalist expression, that he was a painter at one point, or aspired to be a painter. But as Keith says, uh, there is, at no point has he ever exhibited anything publicly, and I don't know anyone, including people who have been inside the Bresson apartment on Ile Saint-Louis in Paris, who have seen any paintings by Robert Bresson. Uh, when you say, uh, I think the expression is good, how did you quite put it, cultivated? Um, in I, say, yes. I would also say cultivated uh, reinterpretation or revisionism or something along those lines. Um, what I was able to confirm, at least in my research in my book uh, for Indiana University Press, was that he started off as a publicity artist. The early, earliest known works that I know were not in film, but from the late 20s, where he was basically working for Gibbs, 
which is a toiletries company. Toothpaste people. Yes, toothpaste people, exactly. A British, former British firm that's now owned by Unilever. So uh, what he did is he started off making a few advertisements. The earliest one I can find is roughly from, I can't even confirm the date, quite frankly, 1927, 1928, which is an advertisement for Gibbs razor blades. It is a lithograph work. So lithography, on some level, requires painting on stone. So uh, on that floor, he was something of a painter, if you like. Um, for the yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. He then went on in his earliest days in his professional life to, I um, have been able to confirm, to develop some ties with a group of surrealists in Paris. Yeah. One who I conjecture was a, um, a mentor to him, an American expat by the name of Howard Hare Pete Powell, a right? He has a very long series of nicknames. They worked together on a photograph uh, from 1932 which has now been given the moniker Lunar Landscape, but it's also, in fact, an advertisement for Gibbs. So he seemed to have been working on commission, getting these advertisements in some of the best uh, uh, journals at the time. One of them was L'Illustration that he worked for, which would have been quite prestigious for uh, a late 20, early 30-year-old photographer. That brought him into these circles. Of he was actually a photographer. He was a photographer at the time. He was a photographer indeed. That yeah. brought into the sphere of these surrealists. He then was a yeah. loose relation to Coco Chanel and did some photography for her as well. At one point he decided, and I agree with you, it's mysterious, to shift to filmmaking. But one thing we can confirm is that shift was facilitated by one of the surrealists. And Keith, you wrote about it in your book and it was my motive motivation in mind to look more into it. Uh, one of those was Sir Roland Penrose, right. who bankrolled his first film and the launch of what was supposed to be a company that Bresson was going to manage, and it was called Arc. Of course, by the end of making his first film in 1934, Les Affaires Publiques, Bresson's budget had swelled so much that the company went into receivership and had to close its doors and then move on into the commercial industry and by then were in occupation. Yeah, I am. I can, can I come in that way a bit? This is from later on. What I did also discover about that I saw was later, much later live, is um, he moved from a he, I'm not sure where he got his money from, but he lived in a very new, quite a plush house, I think he was San Louis, and he was married and widowed, yeah, without children. But in fact, his second wife, I think it's Milen, yeah, was in fact, had in, they'd in fact been, as Bresson wouldn't have called it, an item, um, before uh, uh, they married. Um, uh, but he was always quite, I think, very reserved about his private life. Um, never had children. I don't know whether that was choice or necessity. And one curious story, nevertheless, of a sort of purloined letter variation. Period. When I began working on him, I found his address in Who's To in France. I wrote to him, snake mail, which was all there was in those days, from the UK, and explained what I was doing. This was in the summer of 1952, when he was shooting Laoja, which was to be his sponsor, and asked if he, it would be possible to meet. I, it, it, it was a, a bit of autograph hunting, really. I didn't expect him to be particularly fulsome about the films. I thought he would be rather laconic. I received no reply by the time I left for Paris. In Paris, I looked in the Paris phone book, a copy in those days, and there he was, his phone number hiding in plain sight. Bless her, ah, que d'un jour. I rang at the tough towns. He said, I'm filming near Bastille. Come and see us. And he gave me the address of the cafe. I went there. I spent an hour 
in the great man's presence in which he was basically saying, well, it's all in the films anyway, which was really what I wanted him to say. The punchline here, however, is that when I got back to my university in London, there was a letter waiting for me, clearly sent John Butler from Bresson, saying, thank you very much for your interest in my work. Unfortunately, I'm far too busy filming to find the time to see you. So that was a kind of an instance where I suppose commun communication um, both didn't didn't work. My impression of him there was as somebody who was following his own path, and something I haven't gone into as much detail about, perhaps as I could have done, is what cinematic influences there are on his work. I know that his list of favourite films includes people like Lubitsch and I think in Buster Keaton and stuff that you wouldn't perhaps immediately associate with him. Everybody knows that he has had a huge impact, an impact on filmmakers. So well, I suppose the most, well, one of the most striking examples would be Martin Scorsese, who is, has been very, has borne the imprint of uh, Bresser in a great many of his works, particularly, I mean, the, the ending of Raging Bull, where the, the biblical text comes up on the screen. That is very clearly intertextual homage. But when it comes to what Bresson's own influences are, they're very easy to find in the worlds of literature, particularly Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Batman, Ost. They're uh, music, they're painterly, very painterly, but are they cinematic? Question. Are they cinematic? Well, hmm. that would depend on how that's discussed. I mean, or how, how, what we think cinematic to be, which is, of course, like sort of moving target. Before I get to that, I'll just add on the Keaton point. He also had it to that list. He was he was pulled. There was, there was a pull in Cahiers du Cinéma of you know the top filmmakers and their favorite films. He also included uh, Sergei Eisenstein. There, which That's right. yeah. wouldn't necessarily surprise given that he's also a very editor's filmmaker. Um, but on Keaton, he said that he admired his mathematical precision. So we have some some sense of what he got out of there, although if that's. That, is, that, that, that lands well in the territory of another huge influence on Bresson that we, I didn't mention, and that is Blaise Pascal. No, no. Pascal, full of mystic, but also. One of the great mathematicians of um, his time, somebody whose passing thoughts are an immense influence on, um, and indeed I think Bresson had partially modelled his notes on cinematography on Pascal. That very kind of aphoristic modus operandi, which is so striking in that um, book, yeah? Yeah, I, um, I would agree very much so. I mean, that's yeah. really or of the form. Uh, Pascal, of course, is also a mathematician, and perhaps there is an attempt to, to negotiate the borderline between the calculable, the calibratable, and the spiritual and the other. Um, it may, makes me wonder, I genuinely don't know the answer to this question, how Bresson read Wittgenstein. That is a good question, and we don't because, know. You know whereof one cannot, the, the end of the tractatus, right, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. That, in a sense, could be an epigraph for a lot of Bresson's work. It could also have just appeared as an aphorism in the notes on the cinema, cinematograph. I mean, that yeah. could be a quotation directly from Bresson. Oh, this is the well-known concept of retrospective plagiarism. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, stole his ideas from Bresson. Yeah. Well, I would just add on this point of whether it's uh, on influences. There's a couple of balls in the air here. Let me just catch one of them. I think his influences are interesting to track. A few scholars have tried to do so. I think that we can now view him as one of the most important, I mean, in global cinema or world cinema, one of the most important filmmakers, quite frankly, whose reputation, if only his reputation, maybe sometimes his actual principles, his approaches, his style, have become quite influential across the globe. I myself have written yeah. on Manny Call, 
the uh, Indian parallel filmmaker or art cinema filmmaker who passed away uh, just a few years ago was is one of the most staunchly Bressonian filmmakers you can imagine. That's interesting. Um, very much taking Bresson's ideas, even writing in aphoristic form in some of his essays, uh, which is... digital, but we as well, you get it in, in um, Scorsese. His, his influence is, I think, very... You even get it on Shima, I think. I think so. Yeah, I think so, yes. Uh, here's one that might be of, of interest to your listeners, Dan, which is that um, I came across, and your listeners can look it up, I think it should still be available, uh, the, a PDF of an early script of Dirty Harry. All right? Now, you, you'll now wonder where I'm going with this. There is co-written by one Terry Malick, all right? Mm -hmm. Terrence Malick, of course, as we would come to know him. This is before Terence Malick directed his first film. Well, the final scene of this in this screenplay has no dialogue in it. It's just a lengthy description. A description of some sun beam coming through the clouds, which is a very, very Terence Malick type image, landing on a dying or dead, I can't recall, dirty Harry, as he's encircled by sheep. Jeez. It's, it's the ending to OSR that does all. It's and yet, and yet Ma Malik and Bress are polar opposite filmmakers. I think Ma Malik often is it, Malik is a putter in and Bress is a taker out. I think so. That's yeah, right. Yeah. I find Malik's work by and large talented though he is. A lot of it is very overblown. Uh, people have said a lot of different things about Bress. Uh, not all of them uh, compliment. Orson Welles, because he's well known, um, to, uh, was vehemently antipathetic to his work. But, um, you know, the, the, the um, Bresson's work is quintessentially somebody, I can't remember who it was, said he proves around the essential, whereas Malik's work is very much the opposite. Malik is very much in, the, he's almost got a Walt Whitman, all-embracing multitude filmmaker and to find that intellectual link therefore comes as a surprise and illumination yeah I would I, I thought so at least for my, myself now on the to backtrack and get back to your question on whether or not some of these authors that you mentioned Keith were cinematic as I said cinematic is a sort of moving target it's a, it's a very fluid term um, I a Bresson of a cinematic graphic, as we know. Indeed. I mean, at a certain point, he even started saying, I don't do cinema. I do cinematograph, writing in motion, inventing his own version. Which is quite Godardian as well. I mean, there is a, the Bresson Godard um, interface could take us to the end of today or tomorrow. Good. Oh, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to this day, Godard continues to play off of elements of Bresson without question. He's a great admirer. Um, on the cinematic point, I'll just say this. Um, in my book, I spent some time trying to piece together all the levers, all of the, the things in the air, I'll put it that way, that affected Bresson's adaptation of Diary of a Country Priest, the Bernanos novel from 1936. One thing that rendered that cinematic was, I think, something that was very, very important to uh, in, in cinephilic culture and criticism in the post-war period, which was the question of whether or not cinema could adequately, in its own way, I should say, uh, do what the novel does. So this is a very uh, dice, it's very unique, I should say, uh, uh, way of looking at what's cinematic, in that it can it borrow appropriately in its own way from the novel, specifically with respect to first-person storytelling. There was a premium placed uh, in many, you know, in the writings of stuff, for instance, that made their way into cinephilic discourse and criticism and theory about whether cinema could ever do it, could ever give you a full first-person perspective. Does the attempt by Robert Montgomery to do that, of course, exactly. Lady, Lady in the Lake. Yeah. Lady in the Lake. So that was held up by some as an instance of a cinematic version of what novels were doing. 
In fact, what how was a certain kind of novel was doing? Pardon me? What a certain kind of novel was doing. A certain kind of novel was doing indeed. Yeah. Uh, and a certain kind of novel that was very much valued by many of the top critics and commentators, at least yeah. I found it, at least in France. So there was a whole question that emerged then of how an adaptation of Bernanos' novel, which is first person by and large, would be handled and how that would go. Could it be done? And Bernanos himself, in the immediate post-war period, was going to undertake this. He set out to write a script and yeah. he just couldn't get it done. He just felt like it wasn't working out uh, for one way or another. Then there were various attempts that became quite famous, as we know, the attempt by Bust and Orange, uh, the then famous but now sort of infamous um, screenwriters at the time failed to do it. And then Bresson came along with this question in the air, could cinema appropriately handle first-person storytelling? A whole story told from a single perspective. And when he did it, by remaining, according to him, uh, close to the word of Bernanos, he effectively had solved a major problem and came elevated in French film culture and in French literary culture I too. Think, I think that also interfaces with something Bresson himself probably couldn't have been aware of, but which was in the air at the time. And um, it certainly permeated my work on Bresson, and that is this notion of the eye, uh, the eye as in, in the ego, not the, the, the uh, as somehow it was necessarily constitutively split and you get that in Diary of a Country Priest three times over, you get the voice over, the pen across the page, and the words we see. Because if you're watching a subtitle, but you get that as well, though, I would be inclined to turn off the subtitles at that point. And critics, I think, at the time that film was released, were actually very critical of this. They found it um, a pointless kind of repetition. But in fact, the repetition is also about a, a constituting splitting in the eye, in the conscious or united self, and you can cash that out in different ways, theologically or psychoanalytically, depending on which guru sign you're sending under today. But I think that's very important in that film. I think the, that, that notion of putting the and, and, and also in pre deridian sense as well, of putting writing up there equal with or even perhaps conceivably in some perspectives prior to speech also was very important. And although Bresson is not normally thought of as a kind of abstract filmmaker because there is this extraordinary concreteness to his work, as with the pen across the paper, at the end of Country Priest. Nevertheless, I think these concepts are tackled, are articulated, are worked on in, um, well, in that film. And I could go on, and could as well, I'm sure, give it more examples. Since well, we're on it, I would just add that there is a further layer to this. You added, you, you, you indicated three layers to the division of the eye. Of, uh, and I would add one more thing. I mean, one thing I tried to do in my book was to explore his visual style and try to piece together uh, how his cinematographers worked and how he worked with them. What importance he placed on choices, technical choices like lens choice and so on. Well, what I discovered was this one anecdote, it's a very curious one from his cinematographer, Léon Sarri Burel, who said that Bresson called him to Paris after having tried out, and this is I should just step, take a step back. This is in shooting Diary of a Country Priest. Invited him to Paris to do some tests. But I saw by that point had been working with a few other cinematographers and clearly wasn't pleased with their work. Wasn't giving what he wanted. Well, Zéro uh, has this anecdote where he says, Bresson invited him to dinner and to see a movie. And that movie was The Third Man by Orson, uh, with Orson Welles by Carol Lee. Now, he so apparently said to him, this is what I'm looking for. And of course, yes, third man was scripted by Graham Catholic. Oh. So you've got the theological interface there as well. Right. So uh, uh, when Burel and Bresson had dinner afterwards, the anecdote goes, 
Um, apparently, Bruvel just confessed to him, I don't know why you're looking to do this very harsh, high-contrast style for a film that's going to be quite delicate about personal experience, about the deepest thoughts of a very confused, sometimes uh, self-questioning priest. At which point, Bresson said, okay, fine, let's go do some tests. Well, Ruel apparently had developed his own lens attachment that he put on the front of the camera. And what, and I've spoken to cinematographers trying to piece together exactly what it was. One way or another, it was a lens diffuser of one, of, of, of a sort. Well, in doing the tests, Ruel usually used his own assistants, but they worked with him in Paris. Another assistant from the studio they were working at put the lens attachment on the wrong way, backwards. When Bresson saw the rushes to the tests, he said, Burel, you got it. This is what I want. Burel wouldn't accept it. He said, but Bresson, the images are all out of focus. <laughs> we can't possibly shoot a whole film out of focus this way. They went back and forth a little bit, and they negotiated a visual style. Then your readers, if you, if uh, your listeners rather, if they go and watch Diary of a Country Priest, it's actually quite unlike the look of any other Bresson film. Yeah. It's very soft in its style. Yeah. Um, and when I, yeah, perhaps I'm thinking of Le Dame du Bois-Boulogne a bit. I mean, the three Les Anges du Pêche, Le Dame du Bois-Boulogne, Diary of a Country Priest do have a softer style than his later films. And the editing is less rapid. Well, rapid's the wrong word, but the editing is more muted, more transitional, less um, staccato. Almost. Well, I think yes. it, I think it works for that film because the the priest is basically dissipating before our eyes throughout the whole film. So, in other words, to get back uh, to the point about the, the three eyes, there's another eye here, and it's captured very subtly with a soft style. This, this priest who is dissipating, who is, whose world is a little hazy and confused, and it's capturing that. To use a very crude metaphor, we could elaborate it, on it a little bit, but I just thought at the level of visual style, it's there as well in Diary of a Country Priest. Well, let me just uh, uh, turn uh, back to uh, an influence. I, wanted, I, I haven't seen uh, the film that Brisson did of Joan of Arc, and I wanted to talk about Dreyer's uh, Passion of Joan of Arc, because I know that even though Dreyer was not French, that film made its big debut and was, you know, bruited throughout France and then the world, and it became a pretty much a sensation. I would have to think, since that came out in 27 or 28, that that had to have a huge impact on the, the young man that Brisson was there. Uh, let me just ask uh, yeah. about that. I think that Brisson's John of Arc film was, to a large extent, I think he said this somewhere, consciously intended as a kind of not exactly a counterblast to it, it is the anti-Joan of Arc. There are the comparatively few close-ups. Um, the stress is... Uh, Dry has often been described as a, you know, as a, a kind of a Protestant filmmaker. This is an individual soul grappling with the, with the great spiritual issues of, of life and death. Um, the anguish close-ups of Mario Andre Falconetti, the drier film, bear witness to that. Bresson's film is radically different and I think he has in fact said somewhere that he, I mean, one never knows how far to believe what how far Bresson meant what he said, not quite to the same extent as Goddard, but in that respect he's in a class of his own. Um, but you know, I think that the part of the Bresson trial of Jean-Marc was, you know, well, Bresson's film is a trial, Dreyer's is a passion, and I think that choice of title is very eloquent as to the difference between the two films. Well, another way of putting it might be to say that Dreyer's film braces a pathos that Bresson rigorously issues. I would say so. I mean, I think that Bresson, probably by that point, 1962, when the film was released, was uh, quite inclined to view the drier version as a kind of exercise in vulgar excess. 
and, and therefore endeavored in ways that Susan Sontag found problematic. She said that trial of a Joan of Arc pairs things down too much, um, trying to, to really strip things, and wanted it to be viewed as something of a document, in a way, to the point where, as you, as you know, he went back to the original on the original proceedings of the trial, but he that, the there is a documentary element to it. Yes, he went back to the original minutes and based right. virtually right. everything in the film on the exchanges. He then yeah. said this, um, which I think is curious, and I spent some time on this in my book too, I think he is one of France's great rhythmic filmmakers. Right. Now, what's that? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. To the point where he spent, uh, in my estimation, he viewed the, ch the challenge. I think he, he said this in an interview with Cahiers du Cinéma at the time. He viewed the trial of Joan of Arc not as the exploration of a series of religious themes, although clearly it is, but as a problem in cinematic rhythm. How you match cutting to the pace of line delivery and how you create a rhythmic experience in the shot reverse shot aspect as we go through the yeah. trial and cut between various figures in uh, in the trial itself. Um, so I think very much he, he was not looking at this as a form of direct expression as what Carl Dreyer was doing in his film. So you would feel it in the instant as you look at Balconetti's face and look at her being in a way, torture, of course, um, but a kind of indirect form of expressivity, as someone was looking for, by way of subtle patterns of sensation and rhythm, is what yeah. I was saying. It's interesting yeah. that you mention that because because of the of the filmmakers. I, I mentioned mentioned uh, Paul Schrader's book, Adria, Ozu, and, and Brasson being uh, uh, featured. I think Brasson is much closer to Ozu, but the difference is. Since both of them focus on small things, the difference is Ozu, I find, is very geometric in his patterns. They're blocks, boom, boom, boom. Where Brisson is more algebra or calculus in that it does have more of a rhythm. Yeah. Well, Brisson, I would add to this, I would say Brisson definitely did not want well-composed shots after a while. Yeah. He didn't want shots like Ozu's that would strike your eye as well composed or symmetrical uh, and then create patterns of symmetry over the course of a sequence, even the dialogue sequence as we often find in Ozu or some of the so-called pillow shots, yeah. which were, are quite gorgeous and you remember in themselves as sort of separate entities. Bresson wanted to kind of um, pare things down to the extent where shots became not a fully formed composition or a memorable composition, but just part of a fluid experience. And I wonder, I wonder, you mentioned, you talked about Scorsese. Do you think that Brisson had an influence on the sort of uh, cinema of John Cassavetes, especially uh, Faces and the stuff in the 70s, the way that, the, the, the sort of, the way his camera would sometimes move and just seem naturalistic? Cassavetes is... Casavetes gives the impression of kind of eavesdropping mm -hmm. um, something that would be happening anyway, whether camera was there or not. Bressart doesn't. I think that would be, I think there are I agree with that, that there are points in common, but I, I think that what I've what I've just said perhaps encapsulates a very radical difference between them. You can't you know, it's not as if the, char the characters um, in um, Bresson's films, you cannot imagine them being, as it were, captured by the camera. They are, they're very much a prop filming event. I don't know what you think about that, Colin. I would agree. I would just add this on Cassavides. I mean, perhaps what we could, I, I haven't looked at whether or not Cassavides um, in any consistent way, draws on Bresson, or whether that would have been even on the radar for him. But strictly in terms of comparison, I don't know that there's any direct visual comparison. There might be a comparison between the principles of, in which they're working. I'm thinking of shadows here and the use of non-professional actors, although they would use those non-professional actors radically differently. So maybe that idea was something that Cassavetes would pick up on but push it in an entirely different direction. Another like. filmmaker who I think is, who claimed himself to be massively influenced by Bresson, 
And I mention that it is here because this is a filmmaker about whose work I'm passionate, but whose work has had enormous, is enormously difficult to access for copyright and estate reasons. It's Jean Eustache. Um, you know, either there are direct references to Bresson in the mother and all. Well, in fact, one of the actors, Isabel Weingart, I think it is, makes an, an appearance, yeah? Yeah, I would, I would say so. Um, I haven't looked at that in any detail. I, is, would you say that, I mean, I know that some scholars have pieced that together, have looked at this yeah. major as a, as a filmmaker who picked up on aspects of Bresson. Yeah, I've mentioned that in stuff I've done off and stuff. Some time ago, well, I'm kind of revisiting that area. Right. Uh, and of course, the other enormous influence, Godard, who was to marry Anne Vyazemsky, who appears in Orazan, Althusan. Um, uh, that's, I think, very. Um, uh, 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 you know, there are significant waves being made there. On the connection between, I mean, um, I. There's, this anecdote doesn't really go anywhere, but I did have the occasion to meet Andy Azemsky once on the occasion of her, the release of her, what should we call it? Memoir slash novel? Uh, um, yeah, I've read, yeah, I've read it, yeah. Yeah, called Une Jeune Fille. And yeah. I think it's in the process of being translated if it hasn't been translated already into English, uh, about her experiences in the mid 60s um, on the set of uh, Oazar, Balthazar, where she alleges, of course, that Bresson tried to romance her on multiple occasions. Well, uh, that's not how true that is, yeah. Exactly. I did ask her, because um, there was some pressure by the Bresson estate to block the publication of this, right. yeah. of this text, I'll call it more generically, to the point where it's, uh, if memory serves, and Yazemsky indicated that she was forced to put on the cover a roman, a novel, so that it's a fictionalized account of this, and that's how the reader would take it. Uh, but right. I about the disclaimers you get in Hollywood movies about these characters have no relationship to any real people. Indeed. Uh, she did say, though, that these were based on diaries that she kept. At yeah. the time. To which I asked her, <laughs> would you ever make those diaries available to critics and scholars to look at them to see if there's anything else there. She said, no, there's nothing of interest there. Uh, but I, I bring this in because it's during this time in this novel you get her first encounter with Godard, the connection, therefore, with Bresson and Godard. In that is, yeah. Godard apparently visited the set of Boisard yeah. uh, Balthazar. Um, on this issue of influence, since we're there, uh, to spread this around the globe, and I really do think he's quite an important filmmaker, around the globe, there is the uh, uh, the filmmaker Aki Kurosmaki, uh, who, Aki yeah. Kurosmaki, I think that he, he has uh, written about it, confessed to it, although Aki Kurosmaki is tricky, just as tricky as Bresson, much more ironic and dry. Yeah, he's a, so it's a very dead man humor, isn't it? He is indeed, but you can definitely see Bresson picking up on certain aspects of Bresson yeah. in his movies, especially the use of deadpan performance style, but toward a different end, of course, um, relying upon some non-professional actors as well, pushing it in the direction of political, uh, sort of incongruous humor. And Carol Smacky uses Jean-Pierre Lé, he stars, he used Jean-Pierre Lé, and in fact, I, I know because a student of mine did a doctorate on Lé as a star and interviewed Lé, he helped me, he rescued Lé, whose career was pretty much on the skids at the time, Lé had, had severe drink and emotional problems, and was, was in serious difficulty, and Carol is making kind of pulled him through that. Um, and it, I, I have this vision suddenly of, you know, the, I can't remember the name of the actor who plays him, but there is a tram character that appears in Balthazar and in Chet. Arnold and Arthur. Yes, Arnold, Arnold and then, uh, but I can't remember the, the model's name, the actor's name. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's Arnold, yeah. in Balthazar and Arsene in Bouchette, played by the same model 
I mean, you know, it's not it's not beyond the bounds of possibility to see that model as a kind of pursuit and shambling um, layout type figure. That's there's that same kind of of disorganisation of being out of fuddies with the world around. Well, let me. And one of the things that is interesting about Bresson, in terms of the sort of, one doesn't think of him as a social filmmaker, but he he, does, he is, I think, a filmmaker of dysfunctional societies and dysfunctional moments. Um, examples such as the in one of his least successful films, it has to be said, the hippies in the film Four Nights of a Dream and. Um, even more so than yeah, the devil, probably. I mean, these were it. There's, a, there's always a lens in the Bresson social world. You know, the peace in pla on planet Bresson comes to pass only after you've passed out. Or am I being too saturnine? No, I would agree with it. Um, if just to add one more point about this on the social filmmaker point, and because we're talking about themes, we're talking about the different phases of his career, to add just a quick footnote to this, um, he did say in an interview when it was released, Diary, uh, sorry, uh, The Devil Probably in 1977, that this is his most political film. It's a film in which he's issuing a direct political statement or commentary on the current situation. Um, and it's a film. In the it's, uh, That's quite extraordinary. Quite um, really. Yeah. Indeed. And so what I would say is there is a tendency now to try to turn Bresson into a more political filmmaker than he was. I think that there's that is to be, we should view that with some skepticism. Okay. Uh, I, I think there are some political themes in his movies, but they float in and they quickly, just as quickly go out. But, I, but Devil probably might be the exception there, where it is overtly a post-May 68 film. In many I think, I think that's right. I, I can't. I, I can't imagine Bresson ever going to vote for him. Well, let me uh, let me end this segment, uh, uh, and when, in the next segment, I want to talk about some of the films specifically. But I do wanted to, to touch on one one thing, and that is that Bresson is often thought of as a Catholic filmmaker. But I wonder uh, because you know, if you look at the films of say of T Tarkovsky or Bergman, they deal with some of the same themes, but they're in a sense more mystic and whatnot. But uh, the films that I've seen of Bresson, and I haven't seen much of the later films, nor the first two feature films. Uh, I don't. He doesn't seem to me to be that dogmatically Catholic. He seems to be uh, beyond Eric. just just that. That, that there. Uh, do you detect yeah. hints of mysticism in his work? There is an, a huge tendency among Catholic writers, in particular, but also filmmakers, to take the ostensibly damned, the sinners according to the book. And in fact, to turn them into something like the reverse, get it in Francois Balliac, you get it even more markedly in Graham Greene, whose you know, who's adversary is often complained of kind of metaphysical conjuring tricks, whereby a character like Scobie in the heart of the matter is a sinner, but is there, but is redeemed by and in the act of and at uh, the moment of sinning. And I think you know, the, one of the things about the omnivorousness of Roman Catholicism is the manner in which it, although it creates sinners and then immediately repackages them in, often as, as, as saints or as saved. And I think that that kind of at once co-trailing and polemical um, Taking off the doxy to the point where it's unorthodox, the kind of thing you get in a different way in some of the writings of, or did before he became a joke figure, in some of the writings of Saint Boy Zizek, that kind of playing with the idea of the orthodox and the dogmatic and the letter of the law, that's around a lot in Catholic writers. Very, I mean, Balanos, another obvious example, Balanos, Malia, Grant Green, they do this. It's a trope, it's a modus operandi, 
that is very prevalent in Catholic writing, whether on paper or on film. And I think one can situate Bresson in that line of um, descent. I don't actually know whether he even read, oh, I never knew the answer to this question, whether he actually read Graham Greene's work. He might have found a little too uh, emotional, I don't know. But uh, I think his work can be situated in a, a specifically Catholic tradition that, in, that also incorporates the as I mentioned. I have a slightly different take on this. Um, uh, I think that uh, the, what, what does it mean, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, I've always been curious about the notion that Bresson is a religious filmmaker or a Catholic filmmaker, and I've always wondered what that could possibly mean. If it means that he is drawing on the traditions that Keith has just enumerated in some ways in his movies, whether it's specific character types or plot situations or themes or even the crises of faith that some of the some characters experience, some even some iconography, uh, I would say sure. Yes, but the some people, that's the sort of soft version of considering him a Catholic filmmaker or a, a religious filmmaker. The hard version is that some have alleged that he's really using his films to induce belief, to work out his own personal beliefs, and I'm afraid we just don't, I don't think that the films work that way. Uh, I also don't think that he, we know enough about what his worldview, independent of what we see in the films. Um, he, in fact, has said, I mean, the interviews, again, as Keith has said, are sort of difficult to sort out. There's ambiguities and contradictions. He at one point called himself... A deliberate perversity, I think. Yes. He at one point called himself a Christian atheist, uh, whatever, uh, however we would read that or interpret that. Um, I, I will say, though, that um, I think he is a filmmaker who was interested in certain types of... A, a, a meeting point between uh, certain kinds of traditional life or rural life in France and modernity. The connection, yes, Balthazar, exactly, or Mouchette, for that matter, which was made the next year. Uh, it, in addition, we could add here Diary of the Country Priest. I think, I think, I think he, he was interested in these things and therefore brought in some of the rituals directly of a lot of uh, religious communities, Catholic communies in France. Mouchet going to church. Right. So I think he was interested in having that in his films because he was interested in patterns and pattern, patterns of and patterned behavior and how people went through their lives in, in repetitious ways. Uh, that's the way I would see this. He was interested in a kind of aesthetic that would be, that would lend itself to this. Um, he is also, I think, a filmmaker where we have to, it seems to me, be careful in suggesting that his movies, uh, movies we just spoke about with politics, are directly invested in conveying ideas or sort of political, uh, religious messages. Um, I think that he is a filmmaker whose work is kind of elusive on that score. His, his, his motto might be something like this. We all know the... Cartesian cogito, I think, therefore I am. Um, he, I think his motto is something like, tu uh, penses je suis, uh, you think I scram. In other words, probably to be, to be too playful perhaps, um, he was kind of reluctant to commit his movies to the, to the expression of ideas, he even says in one of Yeah, I think one moment that I'm on, that's the single most moving moment for me in the entire Sonian Urban. I believe to me also seems to me to be an allusion to a painting, which is also a brief tragedy in it. This is the Lamb of the Balthazar. Balthazar is dying a whole right as I think this is a dreadful, tragic death. You know, this is a this is a very, there's a very kind of sentimental animal view of this. Somebody, I think it's Laurel and Jonah Hanfran, says that Balthazar dies in glory. And I think there is an element of truth in that, the sense of relief there. And there is a moment when uh, 
sheep come up to him, clearly visible in the foreground of the man, and it made me think, I think I mentioned this in my book, in view, not only, a, obviously, a lamb in that context would have to have put set us up on an Agnes Day trail, uh, but also in particular of the lamb in the foreground of one of the greatest and most compulsive religious paintings, um, uh, I know, Bruno Valls, uh, Isenheim Altarpiece, housed in Colmar in France, a very savage crucifixion scene, a not a, a serene Christ, but a Christ running with blood in a state of utter physical, mental, and spiritual exhaustion at the bottom of the, the, the I was going to say the screen of the canvas, there's a lamb lifting its leg and pissing blood through its chest into a chalice. That chalice, the blood is recycled. That's a way of saying this is not this this is suffering, but it's not waste. It's being recycled into a more general and conceivably recuperative economy. Yeah. And I wonder if Breslau knew that painting. I don't know. But I would be very surprised if he did. And I suspect that may, you know, in a way, that chimes with the ending, I think, of Balthazar as a death that is not pure loss, but is a loss which is, which is redeemed, but not in a kind of touchy feely or kitschy, schmaltzy way, um, similar to, well, the Catholicism I'm least force-fed in my youth. Well, I was going to bring this up later when we talk about the films, and we can talk about it again in the next segment, but I've, I've said to a number of people, critics, when I saw the film, they are wrong. Balthazar does, is not dead at the end. He is possibly in the process of dying, and that's the difference between religion and mysticism, is he is in the process of dying. He is not dead, and there is a difference between dead and dying, and I think that's a, a point that a lot of the critics have missed and have said. And yeah. When you look at 1960s cinema, you see a lot of misinformation. I, I think of uh, Elaine Renee's uh, 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 Marion Bad and, and the, the use of the names of characters when in the actual film there are no names. The characters are never named. That's just PR material that was put out there. And in the same way, Balthazar is clearly, you can see the donkey is still breathing as it fades to black. So he is not dead. He is in the process, probably, of dying. But that is the difference. And, and if, if, if uh, I think if Rassam wanted us to know he was dead, we would have seen a definitive shot of him dead. No. Uh, any it could also just be the simple fact that he had. A, he, I, I, I'm making light of this in, in a sense, but he had a lot of trouble working with those donkeys <laughs> and getting them to stop well, working might have been an issue. But well, it, they were very, very, some of them were very truculent. I mean, some yes. of them mules from the sound of it. Well, he wanted untrained animals. Well, he got them. He did. <laughs> well, let's end this segment. In the next segment, let's talk about some of the films themselves, and we'll do that in a moment. So we've spoken about Brisson, his ideas, a little bit about his life. Let's talk about some of uh, the major films. Uh, I think Colin had mentioned he did a short film in 1934, Public Affairs. But as I'm looking at his list of films, uh, the first two films of his I haven't seen, uh, Angels of Sin and The Ladies of the Bois de Boulogne. Uh, tell me a little bit about those films and how they set up some of the future themes and how they work as films, uh, either one of you. Uh, Keith, if you want to go first. These are more conventional films. They use name actors and stars. Les Anges du I haven't seen for a long while. Uh, it obviously betokens a, a continuing a fascination with religion, but also, I think, the religious life. And one aspect of this one we've touched on it, but I haven't gone into. I think it's apparent all the way through its films, is it, it seems to me that there is incontestably a degree of sadism in his use of the camera, particularly his attitude towards women, and also towards some of the women who appear in his films, um, a degree of domination, certainly, and on 
films about the religious life, obviously, are lots of different ways of filming the religious life, but very often, uh, as in an event's version of uh, Diderot's La Religia and the Guillaume Clou remake, these are films that present the religious life, institutionalized religious life, as sadistic, as cramping, and in some sense, an imposition, yeah? I would agree with that, with Les Anges du Péché from 1943. Uh, I think it's very much about the religious life, overtly about it. It's mainly set in a convent where, uh, uh, consisting largely of women of uh, destitution who are, live precarious lives and then are invited into the convent and trained, adopt a religious life. And it's about the story of one such young nun who takes in uh, a woman who is on the course of revenge, trying to get even, when she eventually does uh, get even, get even with a man who had harmed her. Uh, and she's a sort of troubled child. She can't be tamed, if you like. Uh, so it's a conflict. That's the, that's the basic predicament that's dealt with there. Uh, I mean, to that, Les Dames du Bois-Boulogne really isn't, has very little in terms of religious thematics. It's another revenge tale. And a film also is interpreted quirkily, but I think suggestively by Godard, because it's an allegory of resistance. Indeed, uh, because both, of course. Yes, but both, of course, are, are set, are, were shot during the occupation. Indeed. Yes. And, and obviously one of the things, uh, as in a totally different respect, totally different genre of film, another film from during the occupation, Carol Ney's Les Visiteurs du Soir, as well, so, then has been taken and used as an allegory of resistance. And I'm never sure, and we will probably never know, how far that is special pleading. And how far it is away, how far it is an accurate kind of um, view uh, uh, of. But God has inscribed me to what a into the context of the occupation of what the French call these anénoirs, thereby, of course, giving um, Bresson's oeuvre again a more, uh, more of a relevance to. The France of its time that might be apparent on a first viewing. Well, let me. I want to move on to Diary of a Country Priest. We talked about that in length, but I just wanted to bring up one point before we move on to A Man Escape. And we talked about the high contrast black and white of that film, and it reminded me of this, the scene in uh, uh, Owl of the Wolf by uh, Bergman, where the young little boy attacks the Max von Sydow character. And it also, because he uh, is dying of some kind of stomach illness, sort of like the, the fellow in Ikiru by Kurosawa, stomach cancer, uh, I'm wondering if that high contrast, if Brisson was aware of that usage in a lot of horror films, because here we sort of have this pious man being eaten alive from the inside out by this thing uh, that's killing him, it, it seems, or, or, or whatnot. And I'm wondering if that high contrast whether he was consciously aware of that use in horror films of the day. I'd be surprised. I think we, I've always found, this is slightly irreverent, but what the hell, um, that the, um, the note that the diet the country priest is prescribed by a doctor in that film yeah. seems to consist of enormous quantities of cheap red wine and sugar lumps which will probably cause the average medical practitioner in the West these days to have a connection. You know, it is there's something very counter-realistic, it seems to me, about that. I don't know how you, how you respond to that, Colin. It, I mean, when I show, I occasionally used to show this film to students and they would watch a projection with me. It was a 16 mil screening. And when this came out, the doctor said you have to drink lots of red wine and eat sugar lumps. You know, the students almost, it almost caused them to fall about, like, because it seems so, so counterintuitive. Oh, yes, it does. It still does. I mean, on top of that, I mean, the sugar lumps and the, the, 
the whenever he eats anything that's apart from or consumes anything apart from the wine and the sugar lumps, it's bread dipped in oh, bread, 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 bread wine. So that's bread. how he's going. He's shown peeling potatoes at one point, I think, but it's a very sparse existence, and he thinks that this and is his, and the other priest. I mean, what you get in that film also is, I think, you know, the um, or three couple of three avatars of the church in Catholic theology, the church militant, which is robust and goes on to do battle. That's the curé de Tulsi who's going on about, if you remember to the, the country priest about what you need is a good belly full of stew or casserole or something. There's the church suffering, clearly, the country priest. And then at the end, subsumed into the church triumphant. So in that respect, as like with so much else in Bressa, it is insistently and simultaneously material and spiritual. And that to me is part of the greatness of Bressa, the simultaneity, the undecidability of the spiritual of the material. From the viewer's point of view, I mean, it, 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 the way that they cut as both, it's something that's very concrete at the same time as it elicits some of these thoughts, some of these, some of these emotional, in fact, or affective experiences. But I would add this on this issue of uh, whether or not he would have, with this high contrast style, would have drawn from horror. Um, one thing I think I mentioned the third man as, as a source. I think it's one thing that's curious about him, and we have to bring in the issue of the problem of biography again with him, is how much he would have seen at all. There is a, um, and how much he would have been aware of other movies. There is a curious, and Keith knows the anecdote very well, a curious footnote to an interview with Cahiers du Cinéma in 1967. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. There was so in the interview, he started to say, and I think it's because he was antsy, didn't like commenting on other people's movies, and so on, but he said, I don't go to see any movies. Well, the footnote basically says bullshit. Yeah, it says bullshit. So he goes to see all the movies, they put it out and says. And the anecdote here is they actually hired a detective to follow him to determine what he was doing. And there are other anecdotes too. Of course, they're all sort of forced history. Are you going to church, going to a brothel. <laughs> but in any case, he was he perhaps saw more movies than he let on. Okay. And Undoubtedly, that's I think there was this way in which, and, and Keith and I have spoken about it many times throughout this conversation, there's a way in which um, he wanted to craft the impression, and I'm not saying that this is duplicitous, it's just perhaps what he was comfortable with at the time, and maybe there was some strategic value in the period of doing this, at a time when being in a kind of very inten intensely in independent and individual filmmaker, you lived pretty precariously. I mean, you, you had difficulty inter interesting producers and so on. He crafted a reputation of himself as someone who was sort of a-cinematic, or just was not a part of film culture. Was I would add, Pardon at, me? The time, at the time many of his major work was being made, the, uh, the roost of French cinema was ruled very largely by filmmakers who worked as critics for Cahiers du Cinéma, uh, Chabrol, Gordon, Truffaut, um, Nimet, uh, and you know, it was as if in order to make films, in order to make auteur films successfully, you had to be steeped from head to foot in a film-going culture. And Bresson is very much, I think, in this respect, curiously, again, there is a kind of a Protestantism in the world there. He is very much an individual bearing witness, and he, he deliberately, I think, takes the opposite of that position. He, de he does deliberately. Whether or not it's true is another matter. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't for a minute believe it's true. I think the Kaye produce were absolutely right. Um, but I, I think Bresson just didn't want to be corralled into a certain kind of intertextual mode of operandi that was very widespread at the time. And fashionable. If I could just add one more point about the about the source of the of the black and white cinematography, um, it we, the tendency we've been doing it this whole conversation. Uh, maybe we can step back for a second. The tendency is because Bresson 
presented himself as and is viewed as an individualist, we tend to ignore how much he leaned on his collaborators to make some very important choices. So I, in, in my estimation, the, the cinematography of Diary of a Country Priest, Bresson sort of okayed it or put his stamp on it and helped to set the sort of broad parameters. But it was Buren. Well, is a key, is a, is a most a cold term. Indeed, Burel was well known, of course, in the 1920s for his work with Abel Gans and other yeah. filmmakers at a time when, you know, there was there was a lot of cross-pollination between French cinema and German expressionist cinema that would rely on these on cinematography of a sort of high contrast sort. And I think what Burel was doing was going back to some of his ideas from that period and presenting it to Bresson and Bresson basically saying, yeah, that will make that will fit here. Dostoevsky was mentioned earlier, and I want to talk about his next two films, because uh, they seem to me the most Dostoevsky of the works that I've seen of his, and that's uh, A Man Escaped and then Pickpocket, which might be subtitled A Man Doomed, uh, because it seems that the, the two protagonists of those films go in different directions. The, in A Man Escaped, there's freedom, there's a new life waiting out there, uh, there's possibility, whereas by the end of Pickpocket, you know that this guy really, I don't think, is changed, and he's going to just be a petty crook the rest of his I life. I don't agree with you no? I mean, okay. the, the end of Pickpocket seems to me to be a very clear homage to reprise of the end of Crime and Punishment. Uh, uh, Sonia uh, redeems Wisconsin right at the end, yeah, and um, right at, the, at the end of Pickpocket you get a voice that says, oh Jean, to get to you, what a strange pathway I had to take, and this again is another Catholic trope, and you get it in the right, as I mentioned earlier, you get it in Green, you get it in Maria, you get it in Dostoevsky, who was after all fashioned in a Russian Orthodox culture that was lower akin in ways to Catholicism and to Protestantism, what you get uh, is the notion of achieving grace by another way, or as, as it, Robert Frost said, path less fun. You take a path, and it's almost as if you plunge up what purports to be the highway to salvation, you plunge into kind of undergrowth, and you you find yourself somewhere else. And I think that the end, the ending of Pickpocket, the lighting contributes to this too, is redemptive. The one thing, and I think Pickpocket is very nearly a perfect film in many ways, perhaps the most perfect of Bresson's oeuvre, or among the most perfect. The one thing that does that mighty, the little on edge there, is the music of the ending, which I find a little glutinous or bad, am I just being crabby? <laughs> um, well, here, how about this? I mean, a lot of, I show Pickpocket a lot. I also, and I teach it. I teach it to students. Well, I also I teach it to about many years ago. I have some time. I teach A Man Escaped a lot as well. A Man Escaped, I will say this, you get this feeling of elation. Absolutely, yeah. It's, 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 one, it's a war film and it's a jailbreak film. It's a jailbreak film. I mean, in a sense, it's his most genre film, if you like, where where you have some clear expectations of where to go. In fact, the title announces, it's not the title he wanted, but it's the title announces, he, the man will escape, or has it's, escaped. In the it's past. also one of the most delightfully humorous ending, when right at the end, if my mother could sing me now. Yeah, you know, the guy's just done something which is almost an initiation right to manhood, and then there's this regression to a certain kind of childish pride in self, and that's remarkable. Right? I think so too. So I would say that on some level I can see why A Man Escaped seems to be a little bit different, and the students feel it. Uh, it's a film that's well, this way, but you feel so constrained throughout the movie, and then you get this big release. It's the thing that, one of the things that Paul Schrader makes a lot out of in his book. Um, I would say with Pickpocket, I'm in total agreement with uh, Keith on the lighting there, um, and maybe it's something that the listeners can go back and check. Uh, at the end, uh, as before he says that classic line, oh, Jean, Jean, what a strange path 
I had to get on to get to you or something along those lines. Just before that, there is a shot from the reverse angle where you get the voiceover of Michelle saying, suddenly something illuminated her face. Yeah. And for the only time in this movie, uh, this movie is very sort of working with a series of tight stylistic or aesthetic constraints. For the one time in this movie, the lighting is openly expressive. Yes, capturing absolutely. His, yeah. Capturing his entire... But that shot is wanted from a different genre of film. Indeed. So he'll risk that type of thing, a more sort of melodramatic, uh, uh, effusive emotional experience, where the, the look of the movie captures the character's feeling at that time, just for but a moment. And then you cut back to the other angle, and it's back to the even illumination. You almost don't trust your eyes. It, 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 it's an epiphany. Yeah, indeed. Um, we have spoken a bit about the trial, Joan of Arc. Let me just move then on to Balthazar and Muschietti. You've, we spoke a bit about Balthazar. They seem to me also to be films that are sort of uh, dealing with similar themes in uh, uh, slightly different ways with, and slight and a, a bit different uh, approaches. Uh, do you would you reckon that those two films are attacking the same subject from different uh, ways or in different means? Not intentionally, uh, at least not from Bresson's perspective, where uh, just as a matter of production history, uh, some had been trying to get uh, Oazak Mendenbach off the ground as a project for about five years, and no, he could interest no producer. And then with the help of Janine Bazin, the wife, the widow of André Bazin, he was introduced to a producer who was willing to finally do it. It was his first original script since uh, Les Anges de Chier, which is to say not an adaptation of a, relig of a, of a previous source uh, of literature or, of, in the case of Escape, a kind of um, a fictional account or an account of the escape. Uh, it was very much invested for a couple of years. Then, when he was done it, the Bernanos estate effectively approached him and said, would you, on commission, adapt another Bernanos novel? And he accepted it. So if there are links, he wasn't sort of laid out that way. It was more fortuitous, but I do see some links. Um, Keith mentioned earlier, if you like, the violence of his movies, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the treatment of his of his actresses, of his model, female model. Uh, you really get a sense in these movies where they are relentlessly exposed to to physical violence, to humiliations, to rape. Um, it's it, it's difficult to watch in that respect, and for that reason, I think some people view these two movies as a turning point in Bresson's career, where, you know, in interviews at the time, he was exposed to the question, I feel as if God has left movies, uh, to which he replied, no, he's just not as visible or something along those lines, but still there. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very, very astute. Well, let me uh, ask about uh, some of uh, the later films uh, that we touched on. Uh, like I said, Mouchette was the last film that I've seen, so I'm not familiar with his post Mouchette work. Uh, we have A Gentle Woman, Four Nights of a Dream, A Lancelot of the Lake, The Devil Probably, and Money. Um, I I are they in any way thematically linked, or what do they all deal I with? They're, uh, linked, they're linked by one absolute fundamental thing, which is that they're his color films. Yeah. Oh, so uh, Mouchette was the last black and white? Bouchette was the last black on the night. Um, for my money, Lange, it's the best of later period. I mean, that would be my um, contention. Particularly its final shot. Uh, but maybe we can come up Well, with that, that kind of a title, what does it deal with? Usury or what? Robbery and the corruption of human relations by materialism, petty theft, and a, a theme which is actually, I think, also quite Hitchcockian. It would be difficult to think of two filmmakers more different in some ways than Bresson and Hitchcock, Catholic, though both were. It's the notion of circulation of guilt. Guilt doesn't inhere in an individual, which is a very Protestant way of looking at it, it circulates, it's part of the society, it's part of the ethical and material commerce that 
binds us together. And in Largean, it's about a, it's a forged banknote, isn't it, originally? That right. sets that is set into circulation. And in fact, that film is based, and I believe I'm right in saying this, Bressel had filmed two Dostoevsky adaptations in Femme Douze and Pickpocket. Pick, well, Pickpocket is loosely a Dostoevsky. Yeah. Loosely, yeah. Uh, this is his first venture into Tolstoy territory. I read, in fact, the novella on which that film is based, The Forged Coupon, I think. Um, and so it's, in some ways, then a return to the Russian thematic of his earlier work. But it's also that much about um, what I would call, I would call the circulation of guilt. Um, and um, I don't know if one takes a Hitchcock film like the wrong man. That theme is very that trope, if you like, to use a more currently monkish turn of phrase. It's very apparent there. I think, uh, but I think Larchand also has not perhaps to the same degree as the Devil, probably. But there is, if not a political thrust to it, then certainly a, there's a strong sense of revulsion and the, cult, the culture of acquisitiveness that was very powerful at a particular, um, at that particular time. That film dates from 1982, 1983, which was the high noon of Russianism and of Thatcherism in the UK, where I am now, we're back where we started in that respect of us. Um, in France, um, there had been a socialist government not long elected, but it was already beginning to show signs of, of, of weakness in certain areas. Um, I think that you know that specific context is very relevant in that film, and that it is about the corruption of society and of human beings by money, and hence to come back to what I said earlier, the, the circulation of guilt. Yes, it's, I mean, L'Argent, uh, to start at the end then, is a is very much a decline and fall, you know, based on chance circumstances. There's an OSA there as well, about the, the worker, Yvon, who, who gets this false banknote in his hand and ends up going to jail, reverting to crime, and then to murder in order to make things work and make ends meet. Uh, I do think it's, it's, it's interesting to, and maybe... Keith will agree with me here to compare with some, one of the, the aspects of his visual style that people often talk about is the close-ups of hands. Yeah. We compare the close-ups of hands. Very well, Pascal, Pascal says that soul loves and love and love very much. Yeah. Very so if you compare the close-ups of what hands are doing in L'Argent, to what hands are doing in A Man Escaped from 1956 or Big Pocket from 1959, you can almost get a sense of a kind of changing perspective there, where hands really aren't all that functional in uh, L'Argent. All they're doing, they're not working or toiling or laboring to some objective. All they're there to do is to exchange banknotes. Absolutely, yeah. It, and, it, we, and, sort of, and there's a little matter of wielding an axe at the end. That's right. No, indeed. I yeah. don't know that we get a close-up of the hands there, but you're right. They are obviously the axes in hand. But um, I will just if I can step back to talk about the color here for a second, because I, as you can probably tell in this conversation, I, I think he's um, one aspect of his work that tends to, maybe Keith will agree with me, tends to be not discussed as much as it needs to be is his visual style from that perspective. I'm talking about cinematography and, and color and things of that nature. Um, he was very reluctant to move to color. I know. Uh, there's not much general about the texture of his films. No. That's what I meant exactly. The sort of the texture, the feel, the facture. And L'Argent La is thinking about it now. Images from L'Argent, the DVDs in one of the other rooms in the apartment, but... You know, I haven't seen the film for ages, and yet, visually, 
the colours stuck with me. Yes. And that's not true of any of the other colour films to anything like the same extent, where the colour would be, be almost to a degree incidental. Or, or, he did colour because he could, he's working most in spite of it, right, with it. And that changes, I think, with Lauja. I do think so. I mean, there, um, uh, with L'Argent, it is quite striking to see him work with a color palette that is actually quite common in a lot of commercial films of the period, which is a pr primary triad of red, um, uh, blue, and yellow, working with this... Also a lot of green at the beginning, the boys yes. green, which gives a kind of affluent and slightly... Um, it does give a kind of well up, almost cosseted feeling. I mean, there's a, it's his most, one doesn't normally associate sensuality with Bresson, but I think that there is a degree of sensuality there. The other thing at the end of Large, at the end of Large, and I, I gather that he must have known when he made it that it would be his last film, because I gather that. Um, he would have found it very difficult to get further funding, owing to the fact that um, insurance cover would have been required for somebody else to take over directing the film when, if he shuffled off this corner during its making. Now, apart from the difficulty, I mean, you know, what are you doing? You're walking along your cell phone, bring hello, uh, restaurant's just died, will you come and step into um, his shoes? I mean, most people will be rather put off um, by that. Um, and um, nevertheless, he clearly knew it was to be his last film. And I wonder if the ending, um, how come on, you don't know the film, do No. As I understand. No, no. Well, at the ending, after Evil was committed, extremely blood, extremely bloodthirst acts murder of an innocent and kindly woman. He's killed somebody because she's been mean. One way of looking at it would be to say she's been kind to him and he hates her for it because he doesn't feel he deserves it. And then the camera pans back. He's arrested. Yeah, the police come to arrest him. And the camera pans back to a line of heads turned around looking. I think we're expecting to see him brought out under arrest, is that right? Instead of which the film comes to an end. And there's a, it seems to me that what Bresson's doing there, assuming that he knew it was his last film, fortunately he's not around anyone to contradict us. What he's doing there is leaving his, not just the film, but his whole book, in a sense, open. My last word, this is my last cinematic word, and it is that I'm not going to say a last cinematic word. Yes, I mean, there's a lot to comment on there. I would, I, there is some evidence, and uh, again, the asterisks and all of the quotation marks around evidence that he, <laughs> in this conversation, it's quite important, that he did think that he would be able to go on and shoot a few more movies at least. Uh, he was, he, he, in his final interviews upon the release, where he seemed quite frail, uh, to be honest, to the point where he... And I, when I met him, it was on the set of the Irish one. Ah. He looked frail, and he was quite shaky. Yes. Kind of, that's, a that's, kind of almost palsy, I would say. Indeed. I think for that reason, when he did those interviews for French television, he, he uh, got them to consent to allow him to stage the shot and where he would be seated so that the camera was positioned quite far back from him. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was quite striking. In fact, one television announcer sort of jokes about it that if, if the cadrage, if the framing seems a little peculiar or familiar, it's because Bresson decided on it himself. I think what he was trying to do there he was, is... He was quite a vain man. I mean, yeah. his, mom, his second wife, Millet, exercised very rigorous control over what footnotes of him what could be published. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know about this, obviously. Yes. No, I mean, so um, the, the, the point uh, to return to here is I think that he wanted to do a few more. He had been working... The thing to understand about Bresson's career on some level is 
because the type of movies he was making, mainly his commitment to his complete um, rejection of the star system, is that he was working with people who would have no value on the marquee. So he, producers just didn't want to finance his work. He's on record saying, I would have made double the amount of movies I made if I could get producers behind my projects. But also the people he was working with, of course, couldn't buy it back if he was a little too imposing or authoritarian. And in fact, there's one a nice pound, a rather chilling quote from him, when he says, I only use models once, because basically he's saying, you know, a vampire never goes back to the same cadaver twice. And he didn't actually say that. But there's a real sense there, and I suck the lifeblood out of these people when I use them in my world. And I couldn't honestly ask them to go through that again. And to the best of my knowledge, the only exception to that rule is the guy who plays Arsene Stroke Arnold in Balthazar and the He's the only one who would take that kind of sadism twice. Yes, I mean... He's, he's the only one who... The, 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 the only entity, human being, sheep, lamb, or donkey, to appear in two breasts on films. Yes, um, and... On the point, yeah. On the point of his career, just to, just to add one more thing, because um, we're on the topic of his final movies, uh, there were a couple of projects that he had been nurturing for some time that he was trying to get off the ground. That was Genesis, wasn't it? The Genesis one. So he did say that his next project after L'Argent would be the Genesis project. We better, he, we better stipulate for the benefit of younger viewers. This isn't a progressive rock and roll group. It's a first book of the Bible. Young he, people like, don't know these things. His, his version of the book of Genesis, whatever that would look like, and we have some sense of what it would look like uh, from in the Cinémathèque Française archive, there's some uh, some photographs that were taken, scouting locations, uh, casting uh, some little miniatures or maquettes that his production designer was creating of Noah's Ark, for instance. So he wanted to he wanted to get this project off the ground. He had been trying to do so since he was invited to Rome to contribute to an omnibus film in the early '60s. But I bring all this up because, in a sense. His final period, his color period, is by and large about contemporary Paris. The one exception there is L'Anselot du Lac, the last yeah. late from 1974, and it seems to stick out as an anomaly there simply because maybe he had the intention of just sticking with contemporary Paris. It would have been easier for him since he lived there and so for less trying uh, to work on, on uh, the contemporary scene. But he had been trying to get, as Keith knows, the Nostro du Lac project, an, an adaptation of the uh, Round Table story, The Knights of the Round Table, off the ground since the early 50s. So when the producer finally got behind it, he said, I'm going to run with this, uh, despite the fact that it may not fit with the rest of the stuff I'm doing now. Um. I wanted to just uh, talk about the influence that he's had on the later filmmakers. When we talked about colors and we talked about guilt, naturally Kieslowski came to mind. And I, I wanted to know if there were any, uh, what effect Brisson may have had on Kieslowski and any other filmmakers in the last quarter century since Kieslowski himself died. Uh, I mean, I suppose the two, film, two filmmakers often bracket together because they are both Consistently material and new transcendence. Kislowski and, and Palkowski, both of them died, of course, significantly younger than, than by some. But I think in both filmmakers, and more, certainly in Tarkovsky's case, are more effulgent. Bresson is a lightotic filmmaker, and they are more hyperbolic to be extremely gross and simplistic um, about it. I think that you can see you can see Bresson's influence to some extent in the book of Alain Cavalier, uh, as I've said, perhaps most markedly in Scorsese. I remember going to see Raging Bull when it came out in 1980, and I was drunk, I think it was 1980 or 1981, uh, I was just beginning to get quite deeply into Bresson. And right at the end of Raging Ball was a biblical text that 
comes up. And the, the person I went to see the film with who didn't have a religious or Catholic background or upbringing, was not a believer in so on, said, I don't know what that's about. And I said, for me, that was the, the anchor of the entire film. And it is also very, it's very Bressonian, except that Bresson, the only Bresson film in which you see written visual text quoted is, of course, Country Priest. I think. In what sense, then? Well, you, in that you see written words on paper. We also have it a little bit in, in pickpocket. A little, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yes. Yeah, you do, the letters that Jean writes and so on, yeah. Yeah, and it, but once he got into his colour period, he seemed to stop using that device, trope, whatever you want to call it. Um, one thing I, well, I'll put it this way, it's a very loose point to make as far as connection to Kieslowski. Um, I would be hesitant to connect the two all that much. Yeah. So, um, you could say, some have argued, that the color palette, let's say, of une femme douce, which is strikingly red, white, and blue, um, would, would perhaps point in a certain direction. Uh, and in fact, uh, Brian Price, uh, in his book, has an extensive sort of interpretation of the color design of that film. But I just plant that. I, I, I didn't buy that. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, mean, I didn't buy the book. I, uh, I, mean, I didn't buy his interpretation. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought it was... He picked it up and ran with it too far, but I don't want to be malicious or anything <laughs> like that, but I, I was less than entirely persuaded. Well, let me let me ask you then to, for some closing uh, uh, comments about uh, Brisson. Uh, for anyone who has not seen his work or is just coming to his work, uh, you know, what are the maybe two or three films that you think are the essential uh, films of his to see? And any other comments you want to make? Let me start with Keith and then end with Colin. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, one of the essential films. Uh, well, if you had to. If you had to, if you had to leave one out, uh, you would pick up the Nuit Marever, Four Nights of a Dreamer. For me, the crestline breasts would be Country Priest, uh, Mouchette, uh, Pickpocket. And for me, if I were told, right, uh, you can see a breast on film before you die, I got which is it, I would pick. I don't know what Collins press on would be. If you, uh, well, so, I mean, it works for me. Uh, this is sort of tried and tested. Uh, if you want to hook people on Bresson and get them interested, it would be a man escaped. I mean, th that would yeah, be a way yeah. to get people. If, if you want to hook the audience, yeah. 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 Uh, people would just feel something there and want to be curious about more. But it would immediately fit into a, it would, immediately fit into a genre frame, but immediately then began questioning and taking apart. Yes. I would say, from my perspective, his greatest movie is uh, Oezar mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. 2-0. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd, make that, I'd make that I'd make that three, so... 3-0, right. Games yeah. is a match. So, uh, and I'll, I'll just add one more thing, and uh, perhaps not to taunt Keith with, it, with the possibility of disagreement here, but I would say... Yeah, <laughs> the um, I've several times indicated over the course of this conversation that I think that Bresson is one of the French cinema's most important rhythmic filmmakers. What does that mean? I think on some level he designs his movies, structures his plots from beginning to end to create a kind of peculiar temporal experience. And I can go into that if you like. Oh, yeah. I, I do think that there are, he also took it, it, it seems to me, uh, and he's never said this, but he took each movie as an opportunity to have one or two crucial scenes where the small design principle, the whole point of it, is to experiment with a type of rhythm. I think here of the, the oft commented upon a uh, bumper car sequence in Mushkete. Yeah. Uh, I think of the... Um, in uh, so, can I say something about that scene? Um, which is, I don't know whether this was 
express our thinking in some ways of Marcel Carnet in that sequence. Because if you think of Quai des Brunes, there's a bumper car sequence there. These days, I don't know what you, what your students do in their spare time, but I, should, I doubt if it's anything as innocent as going to a fairground using bumper cars. Uh, is, is that a trope that's identifiable beyond those two films? I honestly don't know. That's not it's my impression. Just, it's just a way of enjoying yourself in a rather limited, restricted, provincial environment. Okay, yes. so, yeah, these yeah. little carnivals. I would also add, Colin, his hand. You mentioned hands before. The hands against the door and man escape. Pulling boards out, putting them back, smoothing. You can see the yeah. hands doing the same things over the course of the film. Some of the pickpocket sequences, some of the pickpocket sequences are just some of the most extraordinary filmmaking you can yes. see. There's one where Michel, the main pickpocket, is working with two uh, two colleagues. One of them played by an actual pickpocket, Kasaki. Kasaki, yeah, who was yeah. Nice, yeah. It's a virtuosic performance and almost comical. It's a ballet. It's a ballet, indeed. It's a ballet. It's a ballet. It's a ballet. Yeah. Right, so there's uh, a and it's almost comical sometimes the way in which movies are taken. And, and yet, I don't know, whenever I watch them, I always feel like sort of, I found myself reaching for my wallet or yeah. reacting. And you, me you mentioned you mentioned Buster Keaton being an influence. That's probably the most Keatonian sequence in, in that film and in, in the films I've seen of his. Actually, an important intermediary there is work I think. In fact, he, he does, he appears in, in, in Pickpocket. I think Pierre Atex. Yes, he does. Pierre Atex was a major French silent film well, comedian, yeah, and filmmaker. Uh, what, what were his best known films? Uh, oh, I have to jog my memory there. Um, uh, uh, well, nonetheless, uh, silent uh, cinema uh, is. The Grand Tour is his best known film. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the great. He's almost the only instance I can think of in French movie making of a type of filmmaker who was very high profile in Hollywood, Chaplin most obviously, but also King, the comedian who also directs his own work. And Pierre Etex is, um, is an important influence there, and he appears in fact, he is one of the pickpockets in the Kasagi sequence there. So what we're doing here is we're enumerating some, not just films, but important sequences, it seems to me, that yeah. people should really pay attention to. One final one, and this was the point perhaps that will be of contention, is I think in his career, among these sort of rhythmic flourishes, these sequences where he's performing a certain type of rhythm or playing with it or experimenting with it, I think perhaps one of the most ambitious is in The Devil Probably. Yeah. It is viewed by some as being quite lesser, but there's a sequence where two of the protagonists, for a totally unmotivated reason, which indicates his willing his desire to use this as a kind of isolated experiment, unmotivated by the plot, that is, they take a public transportation, and the, the title of the film comes out in dialogue there. And let me just lay it out this way. Yeah. The, the two protagonists start asking questions about what's the cause of all of the, the plight of the worker, the, the situation that the worker finds him or herself in, the malaise of society as we've talked about it here. And then you get snatches of dialogue, a, a, a conversation that nearly emerges, but it's interrupted by the rituals and the repetitions and the rhythms of public transportation. It's a kind of ironic comment on the fact that this space is a space where workers convene. It's a space where perhaps snatches of conversation emerge, but they can never coalesce to form a conversation. That that, that's of that course, it was near crash when the, the bus jumps to a board. Somebody right. says, who, who's in charge in this world? And somebody else over the devil, probably. That's right. And so I think it's one of the most... It's an almost borderless one taken out of contacts. Indeed. Well, I want to thank both Keith Reader and Colin Burnett for uh, their time and their insights. Uh, I will link to both of their uh, web pages. Anyone who's uh, enjoyed this can contact uh, them there. So, again, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, can I just say, first of all, thanks very much. 
to Dan for putting up with my flounderings with Skype. I was a Skype virgin, as Dan found out, to his cost. And um, this involved a great deal of probably slight clutzish toing and froing. I didn't want to fuck up on the big day. Unfortunately, <laughs> we managed to avoid that. Uh, and my thanks also to Colin uh, for being such a stimulating and helpful interlocutor whose book I very much that I'm sourcing this to run a review in a journal to which I contribute and I look forward to talking into it. Thank you guys both very much indeed. Well thank you much to you both as well. Um, I will say this, I haven't seen Keith in person in 12 years. I think it was since uh, studies and since French Cinema Conference in 2005 where I was a very young MA student at the time. And he was very in, in um, was that in London? Or? It was in London, and he was very encouraging to my work, so it's a pleasure to see a mentor like this and to have a conversation like this. All I'm, these years. Okay, but I'm delighted that the part I walked all those years ago has done so well. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again.